but if they want to continue in this, they will. But, uh, you know, just it, it's been a good, solid, healthy understanding from the Word of God the past couple of weeks. So don't worry tonight if you didn't get a hold of the first two messages. Uh, tonight's message will stand on its own. We'll review that sort of a thing. But tonight's message will stand on its own, and you're going to be blessed tonight. You guys got your Bible? Get your Bible in hand. I know I had you stand up, sit down. Now, if you want to stand, you're welcome to stand. If you want to sit, you're welcome to sit. But I'm going to humble myself and get down on my knees before the Lord and pray. Because how many of you know Pastor Dan really, really, really needs God? Anybody know that? What are you waving for? My goodness. Throw them out. All right. Now, listen, I do need God. But guess what? You need God too. So let's honor the Lord. Get your heart prepared and let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful. God, to be in your presence, to be in your house. God, you are holy as we lifted up our voices and sang a moment ago. The Father, in your presence, there your power is. So, Father, we pray, Lord, in your presence tonight that you would powerfully, mightily move in our midst, God. We want to hear your word. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. We welcome you in this place. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives where we've gotten off track. Get us back on track. Father, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Truly tonight, Lord, we didn't come to hear from a man from a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, and their color. God, we came to hear from you. So we welcome you in this place, Lord. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with your power. Bless us with your word tonight, God. May we have a revelatory understanding, God. We don't just want information, God. We want a revelation tonight, God, so we can walk in who you've called us to be. Lord, tonight we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves only. We ask it for all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God, that are preaching here in the gospel. Many churches have a midweek service. Bless them as they gather. I think the way is gathering tonight, God, be with them, Lord. Uh, I know that there are other churches in the area, God, Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, and Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels. God, we bless all of the churches, Lord. Uh, Father, all of the evangelical free churches, and Lord, denominational, non-denominational, doesn't matter to us. Bless the persecuted church scattered abroad throughout the nations. Watch over them, deliver them, God. May they endure to the end, to the glory of God. It's in Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. Tonight, have a seat. Get your Bibles and go with me to John, the book of John, chapter number 14. John, chapter number 14. Tonight... This is a message titled, Spiritual Authority for Spiritual Battles. Like I said, this is part number three of a little three-part series I've been doing, and uh, just talking about our authority in Christ, the things that we have. And how many of you know that there is a spiritual realm and there is a spiritual battle that is going on? The devil is not happy that you're a Christian. He's not happy that you're winning. He's not happy that you're moving forward. He's not happy that you're getting better. He's not happy that you're getting cleaned up and you're on your way to heaven. He's not happy that you bear the image of God and that God has given you authority. And as a rogue power, he is still loosed on the earth and he is still swaying the systems and therefore we're in a fight. We are in a war and we are in a battle and we have to understand that and know that. And in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it tells us to stand in the position of fighting these spiritual battles. Now, we're not going to go there tonight, but I just want to remind you of some of the things that we've talked about already. Now, after we're told what to do to stand, right, and to fight, we're given an arsenal of weapons, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked one, feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And at the end of this list of weapons, at the end of the arsenal, it says this, it says, praying always with all prayer. See, the the battle is often fought and won in our prayer life. Remember, we're talking about spiritual authority for spiritual battles. If you're going to fight a spiritual battle, you're going to have to pray. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith, and you're going to have to pray always with all prayer. That means there are different types of prayers. There are supplications. There are thanksgivings. There are petitions, right? You see all these types of prayers. There's praying in the Spirit. There's different ways that we can pray. And we're to pray at all times using all types of prayer. God wants us to be in his face. God wants us to connect with him. But many times we've prayed and we haven't seen the results that we desire. Why? Right? I know that you've prayed and haven't gotten the results that you desired. You want to know why I know that? Because I've prayed and haven't gotten the results that I've desired. 
And all of us go through this as Christians. So hopefully you're not sitting there thinking that you're God's least favorite child and that he's out to get you and that he's not answering your prayers because you've messed up or done something wrong. We all encounter this, but we need to understand how to pray and especially how to have authority in prayer. What if I told you that there was a way to pray and get results? Would you want to know how to do that? What if I told you that you would pray and see battles won. Would you want to know how to pray like that? How about of this? What if I told you every time that you would get the results you desired? Now, it may take some time, and it may take a process. God might have to work some things out, right? But what if I told you that every time you would see results? Would you want that? Of course you would. We all would, Right? And yet Jesus, in John the 14th chapter, I had you turn there for a reason, because in John 14, verse 13 and 14, Jesus starts to make these grandiose statements, these, these, these statements to, that to our thinking are outlandish. Like, for instance, in verse number 12, he says, the works that I do, greater works than these you'll do. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Jesus, what are you talking about, greater? What are you talking about? Jesus, you raised the dead. Jesus, you healed the sick. Jesus, you, 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 you taught with authority. How, how could we do greater works? Well, greater in number, right? There's more people, more Christians on the earth. There, there's going to be greater in length and duration. Jesus was on the earth for only three years. Now the church has been here for millennia. There's, there's a greater number of works going on. Also, here Jesus would speak, but now we find the apostles walking by Peter, right? They were lining people up just to get in his shadow and people would be getting healed. Didn't talk to him, didn't say anything to him didn't even use the name of Jesus. He'd just walk by and people would get healed. They took handkerchiefs to Paul and Paul would pray over them, lay hands on them, and then they would take them to someone else and they would lay them on them and they would get healed. See, there were some unusual miracles and things that took place and Jesus makes these statements that come true. You can see it in the Word. But look at the statement that Jesus talks about in our prayer life. John chapter 14, verse 13 and verse number 14, and whatever. I, I just like everybody in the room to say the word Whatever. Say it like you mean it. Whatever. Whatever. Notice Jesus is making a bold, brave statement. He, he's making an expansive statement. Whatever you ask in my name. Now, notice he puts a quality on it. There has to be a way that we pray. It has to be in his name. And we talked about this. Being in his name means in his authority. It means in his stead. That we are now ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We come from the kingdom of heaven, and now we represent heaven on earth. And what we say represents as if heaven itself was saying. So Jesus says that whatever you ask in my name, in my authority, in my stead, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that I will do. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Why would he do that? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. God gets glory when Jesus moves forward the plans and the purposes of the church. Now, we're going to talk about this and the conditions for this to happen. Verse 14, if you ask anything, once again, he puts the door wide open, doesn't he? First we said whatever, now we're saying anything. Everybody say anything. anything. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Guys, that is like the craziest, most amazing, most wonderful statement from Jesus. From Jesus himself to the apostles, to you and to me today because the word is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he said to them, them, is what he's saying to us here and now. We need to ask in his name. Now, once again, someone will say, um, but pastor, I have a question. Okay. What is the question? The question is, I prayed a prayer, and at the end of that prayer, I said, in Jesus' name. Or I prayed a prayer, and I started it off with, in Jesus' name, and I still didn't get results. Am I doing it wrong? Am I saying it the wrong way? Does it go at the beginning? Does it go at the end? Right? We almost feel like we're sitting with the teacher, right, where we say, can I go to the bathroom? And they say, can I? Can I? Yes, you can, and you almost feel guilty for asking the question, well, I, you know, I'm, something's going to happen here in the seat if I don't move, you know, like, 
May, may I go to the bathroom? Yes, yes, you may, right? And then they usher you out. And we almost feel like that with God sometimes in prayer, don't we? Am I doing it right, God? Can I? I mean, may I? God, uh, I really don't know what's going on here. How do I pray? In Jesus' name or not in Jesus' name? I don't know. But God is not into semantics. That's not what God is all about. God is not about idle words and babblings. Jesus himself said, don't sit there and make long prayers to look good to other people. He is more concerned with the attitude and the expression of the heart. See, Jesus gives us the way to do it, and he says we need to ask in his name. If you wanted the secret, that's it. Doesn't sound very amazing, doesn't it? And experience will tell us that it doesn't work, but let's review for a second and see if we're really asking in his name or just tagging the line in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. Remember, we said this in the very first part of the series that we, we carry an authority. You and I have authority here on the earth. It's been given to us. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, and go ye therefore. In other words, the therefore is there for a reason because of what he just said about receiving the authority, and now we are the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the gathered saints, the ruling, reigning monarchy now on the earth. Now he says, I want you to take my authority, and I want you to go. He reinstates man's purpose on the earth. He said to go, and, and what did he say to do? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, right? The original intent of God for mankind was to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth, to subdue, and to have dominion. In Mark chapter number 16, you remember we talked about this. He said that in my name they will cast out devils. In my name they will speak with new tongues. In my name they will tread on serpents and scorpions. That sounds a whole lot like subdue and have dominion, doesn't it? So be fruitful and multiply. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and to subdue and have dominion, to tread on serpents and scorpions. So we have authority. We have the Word of God. The Word of God is unchanging. The Word of God is unfailing. The Word of God is eternal. God cannot lie. Therefore, based on the authority of God's Word now, if we speak the Word, it has to happen because God will not be made out to be a liar. He watches over his word to perform it. Okay, this is all just review right now. And finally, we said our faith. Remember that our faith is a part of our authority because when we speak in faith, we have to believe that we have those things that we've asked and therefore they will come to pass. So what does it mean to ask in Jesus' name? Remember, we said this. It means to ask in his authority or in his stead. But see, I find it, it's less about the anything the in Jesus' name part, and it's more about the asking. It's more about the authority in asking. Why? Because we've seen prayers that have been read, they've been monologues, they've been lengthy, they've been boring, right? We, we've seen these prayers. In fact, sometimes we give up on our own prayers. Partway through them, we start yawning and fall asleep, right? Because we're praying finally at the late, late end of the night. And our heart is not in it, but also we're not carrying our authority, we're not carrying the word, and we're not carrying our faith into our prayers. See, when Jesus said ask, he used a certain word that that really in the original language means to request or to petition. It's usually used in the sense, and you can find this all throughout the Bible in the examples where it said someone asked something of someone else, that it was someone in a lesser position asking someone in a greater position for something. For instance, Jesus gave a parable and talked about which one of you who has a son asking his father, okay? It's the same Greek word. He he talked about soldiers asking something of a superior commander. He he talked about uh, uh, people that were living in a kingdom asking things of a king. He he talked about beggars, right? You find in the book of Acts chapter number three, there was a beggar sitting at the gate called Beautiful asking alms, It was a direct request. It was a focused request. And it was a a, a request that someone is asking insistently and without any qualms. Let's go back to the illustration of Jesus' parable where he talks about the son asking his father for bread. Any dads in the house? Okay. When your child asks you for food, do they ask direct and insistently? Mine do right? Any moms in the place, okay? Moms, when your children ask you for food, do they ask you insistently and directly? Yes, they do. Yes, they do, okay? I love parents in the house. Anybody not have kids in the place? 
But you've heard someone else's kids ask their mama or their daddy for some food. Are they asking insistently and directly? Yes, they are. Okay, y'all been at McDonald's and they said, I want the five pace right now, right? I want a happy man. I don't want that stupid toy. Make sure they don't give me that one. I want the other one. You're like, gosh, kid. But it's in that sense that God says, I want you to ask. Not rude, not, not uh, you know, never demanding something of God, right? But rather putting a demand on God. There's a difference. We don't demand, we don't command but it means that we are adamant in our request and demand assistance to meet tangible needs. Most of the time, all of these examples that you find in the Bible is asking for a tangible need, food, shelter, money, help, some sort of aid, et cetera, et cetera, all right? They are directly asking for something. Which one of you who has a son, if he asks for bread, there was a tangible felt need to satisfy his hunger, he wanted food, Right? The person asking alms at the gate, beautiful. They were asking very directly, and they were asking insistently, alms, please, alms, alms, right? They wanted money. And so it says, Jesus says, if you ask, if you insistently come forward before God with an adamant request or petition of the superior one, God your Father, he says, if you ask anything, I will do it for you. Somebody should have shouted amen right there. See, we're not commanding God to do our will, nor are we demanding rudely in prayer. Rather, we are boldly asking God for what he already desires to give us. I don't remember who made the quote, but someone once said that prayer is not overcoming God's objections, but rather it's working with God's willingness. That's what this should always be about. When we approach the throne of God, you need to realize that God wants to answer your prayers more than you want to ask them. Hopefully we'll have you shouting by the end of tonight's message. How did Jesus ask? How did Jesus ask? Remember, Jesus, throughout the Bible, he he asked certain things of certain people. He went and he prayed to the Father. But I want to show you an instance where it uses this same word, this direct approach of asking. John chapter number four, the Bible says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The reason why he needed to go through Samaria was that he was going to have an encounter with a Samaritan woman, that he was going to talk to her and he was going to reveal to her that he was the Christ. And in this, Jesus has an unusual way of breaching the subject. He gets her attention. Here's how he gets her attention. In John Chapter 4, look at verse number 7. It says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now, he probably didn't say it like that. I just like reading it like that. But here he is at the well. Here's the woman coming out, comes to draw water, and Jesus says, Give me a drink. That's probably how he said it, right? She had the means to draw from. He did not. She probably had a bucket and a rope. She probably had a little label that she could scoop out a drink for him. And so here Jesus looks at her, sees her drawing water from the well, and says, give me a drink. Did you see the word ask anywhere in that verse? Is there a question mark at the end of the verse? No. Jesus simply said, give me a drink. Okay? Drop down to verse number 9, and to verse number 10. Verse number 9, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Did he ask? No, he said, give me a drink, right? But that was really a ask. It was a request. It was a petition. He was making known what he wanted. That's the type of asking that God is saying if you ask, if you make known your request, your petition, the thing that you want, if you are direct in your approach before God in the authority that I have given you to do so, then I will go and I'll get it for you. Hello. God's wanting to change our prayer life. Look at what it goes on to say. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse number 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink. Notice he didn't say he who asks of you. He who requests with a please at the end and a cherry on top. No, he says, and who says to you, give me a drink, you would have 
asked him. You would have requested from him. You would have petitioned him. You would have turned around and said, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to give you a drink. You give me a drink. He says, if you knew me, you would have asked me, and he would have given you living water. In other words, I would exceed your expectation if you will turn around and do things the way that I would have you to do them. Remember, we're not demanding things of God. We are putting a demand on God. We are submitting our request. We are saying to God, because was Jesus rude in this? Absolutely not. The Bible says that love is patient, love is kind. It is not rude, right? And God is love and Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is not rude. He would not have said, give me a drink, woman. He wouldn't have done that. He would have probably very lovingly said, give me a drink, knowing that this was going to breach a whole, that was a little pinprick that was going to breach the dam, right? He knew that this was going to blow her life wide open. He knew that this was going to start a revival in Samaria. He knew that the whole town was going to come out and start talking to him. He knew that this was going to be a way that he introduces himself as the Christ to a people who are cast off and who are hated. And so I imagine that Jesus with a smile was waiting because he had to go through Samaria and he had to tell this woman, give me a drink. Because he knew that that would start a conversation that would blow this thing wide open. In the same way that Jesus asked this woman for a drink, give me a drink. That's what God is telling you. And that's what God is telling me, how we should approach the throne. We must be, uh, we, we, we got to come in the same manner that, that he approached her. We should approach God. So how do we do this? How do we do this? A couple of things quickly that I want to run through tonight in the next 10 minutes. And I want to just get our understanding of how this works. Because remember, this is more about the quality of your prayer than the quantity of your prayer. This is more about the heart than it is about the way that it comes out of your mouth. God is not looking for eloquent these and thous in your prayers, and he'll check off the old King James language, and if you say it pretty enough, then you'll get what you want. No, this is about us coming with a heart that believes God, that knows what it wants, that knows why it wants it, and how it's all going to work. And then we come to God, and we put in our request, we put the demand on heaven, and then Jesus Jesus says, whatever you ask, if you ask anything in my name, in my authority, I will do it for you that the Father would be glorified. So the first thing is this, ask in faith. Ask in faith. Remember, we already talked about this, that this is the faith that we hold. The authority that we have is an authority that we have by faith. You entered into this relationship with Jesus in faith, you're going to sustain this relationship in Jesus in faith. And it's by faith because Jesus said, ask, you may feel like you have no right to ask. And yet the very fact that you've been given entrance, that you've been given authority, that you've been given the position in the kingdom of God shows that you should be able in faith to say, you know what, in the natural, I'm not worthy of this. In the natural, I shouldn't be able to ask this. But you know what? I'm not natural any longer. I'm a spiritual being living in a natural body. And therefore, I'm going to pray the way God would have me to pray. I'm going to pray some bold prayers. Can I push you tonight? Can I, can I, can I push you a little further tonight? Your prayers are too small. Can I rub you the wrong way? You have not asked enough yet. I haven't either. Why? Because our God is so much bigger. I serve in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20, God, who says he's exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could even ask or think. That's my God. That's your God. And so we just have not been asking big enough. So we need to ask in faith. See, we cannot be moved by what we see. If we're only moved by what we see, it's not faith. Well, God, this world's really going down, you know, the toilet, and it's just getting worse and worse. And God, I hope that you can do something. And I would imagine God is feeling like Jesus was when the the father was showing him that his demon-possessed son and said, if you can do anything, and Jesus said, if I can do something. Now, that's when I I do believe I'm quoting him the right way. If I can do something right. If he'd have been someone from San Bernardino, he might have. (laughs) If I can do something, what? Are you kidding me? Do you know who I am? Do you know the authority that I carry? If I can do something, the man says, forgive me, help me in my unbelief, right? And the Lord moves on his behalf. 
But see, we cannot be moved by what we see. We cannot be moved by what we feel. You know, I, I'm going to talk to the young people for a second and, and even to the older people because I, I know all of us deal with this on some level, but out of the younger people, I hear something that concerns me. And that is, is that so many times I hear people say, well, I feel like, and it's like, okay, that's great, but the fact is, right, or, or this is the situation that we're sitting in, right? Yeah, I've even heard it coming out of my kids, and I've had to stop them and say, well, wait a second. Since when do we go by our feelings? What does the Word of God have to say about that? Right? And I've trained them, and I've taught them, listen, you could be tired, and you're not feeling very good, and because you're not feeling good and you're weak, you're going to make a bad decision if you go based on your feelings. Right? Or, or you may just not feel like, you know, there's times where I'm just flat out lazy, and I don't feel like doing nothing. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like working. I don't even feel like watching TV. I just want to go to sleep, you know? Flat out, plain and simple, lazy. But do I go by what I feel or do I go by what is right? Do I go by what is dutiful? Do I go by what the Word of God has to say? See, there are certain things that I do because it's my duty to do them. You know, there's certain times I don't feel like going to church. And I'll tell my wife, honey, I don't feel like going to church. And she says, you got to. You're the only one preaching the message this weekend. But see, if I went by what I feel, none of this would be happening. Why? Because we don't always feel like doing what, what, what we need to do. And, and yet, in our society, in our culture, and especially amongst young people, it's a lot, a heavy amount of things on feeling. If you feel like this, if you feel, and, and, and it's deceptive. And it's gotten to the point where things that we used to think were sound wisdom now have become crazy. Just take a look at what they're trying to teach in our schools. If you feel like a woman, you're a woman. If you feel like a man, you're a man. If you feel like a dog, you must be a dog, right? Can we talk tonight? Okay? It's time for us to stop pussyfooting around these issues and patty kicking. And if this offends you, I'm sorry. But a man is a man. A woman is a woman. It's simple anatomy. I, see, that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter how you feel. You are, right? Right? And therefore, in the same way, when it comes to our faith, it's not about how we feel. Well, I don't feel very powerful. I don't feel very authoritative. I don't feel like God's listening to my prayers. Listen, it's not about how you feel. Your flesh is at war with your spirit. Oftentimes, when you're praying and you're fighting the battle, you're going to feel every other way than how it actually is. And you have to press through, and you have to fight through that. You're getting some weak claps in this place. It's like you guys have never been taught this stuff before. Or maybe... Maybe I'm preaching to the wrong crowd tonight. But listen, God is saying, don't be a wimp. You're in the Lord's army. There's bullets flying around. There's blood everywhere. It's time to pull yourself up. It's time to dust yourself up and fight the good fight of faith. After you've done all this, stand. Not lay down and cry. Stand, therefore. And that stance is a stance of faith. And so we have to, have to, have to not be moved by what we feel. We must be moved by what we believe. See, when we're moved by what we believe, we will see what we believe moving things around us. Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter number 11, you're there in John. Turn back with me to Mark. We're going to play in the Gospels and a couple other scriptures in, in the New Testament tonight. Mark chapter number 11, verse 22 through verse 24. Mark chapter 11. Verse 22 through verse 24. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. As he travels, he sees a fig tree. It's got leaves on it. When leaves are on a fig tree, there should be fruit on the fig tree because fruit comes first, then the leaves. So Jesus comes up to it expecting, the Bible says, to find fruit on it. He finds none. He curses the fig tree. The disciples look. Nothing happens. They leave. They come back the next day. The same spot, find the same tree, and this time it's withered up by the roots. One of the gospel accounts says immediately. I would say that over a night, that's immediately, right? There's no contradiction. And they say, look, master, the fig tree that you has withered. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Look at this, have faith in God. Verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have Whatever he says, he's talking about the stance of speaking and declaring the will and the counsel of God. Have faith in God and start to declare things on the earth. Verse 24, therefore I say to you, because of what I just said about having faith in God and taking that stance and declaring the will and the counsel of God, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask 
Remember that ask is not just a, could we please, please, sir, may I have some more? That ask is, here is what I'm requesting. I am putting a demand on heaven. This is my petition, God. This is what I want. This is what I see. This is what I know. This is what I believe. Whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Look at this. And you will have them. You want to know why you'll have them? Because if you ask in his authority in your name, in, in, in faith in Jesus' name, and in the authority that you have, Jesus is going to go get it for you. That's what he said in the Gospels, right? So we ask in faith with no doubting. Because he who doubts is like a wave tossed to and fro, James says, and he shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Second thing is this, is ask in his will. Ask in his will. Bounce back to John chapter number 15. You were there in John 14, now John chapter number 15. In the midst of a very beautiful, very poetic language, very poetic discourse about the vine and the branches. Jesus talks about himself being the vine and his disciples, we being the branches, that we all come off of him, that we all receive the life-giving sap and the fruit-producing power from staying with him. Look at what he says in John the 15th chapter, verse number seven. He says, if, everybody say if. That's the biggest little word in the Bible, isn't it? And it's one of those conditional statements. It's like a teeter-totter. Everything teeters on this one statement. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Notice, he says, if you stick with me, if you live, stay, and dwell, that's what abide means, live, stay, and dwell. If you stay with me, and look what he says, and my words abide with you. Remember, the word of God is unchanging. The word of God is the authority of God. God cannot lie. So if you stay with me, and my words, my will, my counsel abides in you, lives, stays, and dwells in you. Look at this. You will ask. You will petition. You will put a demand on heaven what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Notice the condition. If you stay with me, and I stay with you, that's why when people say, man, I haven't been really with God, and I, I shot up a prayer one time. Now, sometimes God will answer those prayers, Right? especially for the unbelievers, because God wants people saved, and God sees the heart. But if it's a flippant thing that, you know what, God, if you're real, then just do this, right? You haven't been abiding in him. Those prayers, God will not be your circus monkey doing what you desire in that sense. He will be a chump to no man. He's not out there with a little tin can trying to get change from somebody. That's not my God. God will not be made to be some circus act. God is not a slot machine. You put the quarter in, pull the lever, and the blessings come down. That is not God. God is to be respected. He's to be revered. But listen, if you abide in him and his words abide in you, then you will ask whatever you desire. Why? Because you will be asking according to the word of God. And anything in the word of God, yes, you can have it. Right? It's almost like you've been given a catalog. Right? Anybody surf Amazon? Right? Think about all the products in Amazon. You probably could not exhaust the number of spatulas that you could look up on a daily basis. Is that right? And every day they're coming out with new stuff. All the time. You could not exhaust the tens of millions of products that you could potentially purchase on Amazon. God has given you a catalog that is much greater than Amazon, than Sears Roebuck, for some of you guys that remember that one. God's given you a greater ability to select and choose from his word. And so he's saying, I want you to have... You're living, you're staying, you're dwelling in me and my word. Get the whole catalog on the inside of you so that when you start to ask, according to what you see in the catalog, the answer is yes, I'll get it for you. I will deliver it to your door, free delivery, two days. Not two days sometimes, sometimes, but a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, right? First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. You want to turn towards the back of your Bible, look at this. I want you to see this again in a different way. First John chapter number five, right towards the end, verse number 14 and verse number 15. If you have Revelation, just come back a couple books. First John chapter number five, verse number 14 and verse number 15. It says, now this is the confidence. Everybody say confidence. You, you can have confidence in prayer. Remember, I said, what if I told you that every time you prayed, you could know that you'd get results? Would you want that? Everybody said, yes, pastor, we want that, right? Here's the confidence. Here's the way that you know. This is the confidence that we have in, his, in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, 
He hears us. You know, that helps me to pray even stupid prayers. Why, why do I say that? Because there's been times where I don't know if it's God's will for this to happen or not. But I can be bold and I can be confident in asking because if it's not God's will, he doesn't hear my stupid prayer. Anybody listening? See, some of you guys thought that God was going to be laughing at you if you prayed a stupid prayer. God, please let this happen, right? I prayed stupid prayers. God, please let this happen. And then later on I said, God, thank you so much that that didn't happen. It was a stupid prayer, God. I'm glad that it wasn't according to your will and that you didn't hear me because I saw the outcome on the other end, right? Some of you, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Verse 15, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, everybody say whatever. That's the whole catalog. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked, that we have requested, that we have petitioned, that we have demanded from him. Wow. You can know if you ask in faith and if you ask in his will. If it's in his word, if it's in his will, then God hears you and you will have it. Last thing is this, is ask in gratitude. Ask in gratitude. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6 says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, your petitions, your demanding be made known to God. And the Bible says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. I want you to know something. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. That right there will settle a lot of things down in your heart. When you see situations come up, when you go to work and they're having layoffs, when you look at the news and they're introducing ungodly curriculum into our state, when you look around the neighborhood and it just doesn't look the way that it used to look and things are starting to get run down and the, the, the little brothers from Stan and Lean Incorporated are standing on a corner leaning on a pole and you're wondering what they're up to, Right? When, when, when there's things going down in life, when family members are falling away, when friends that used to be close are now doing their own thing, see, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You ever heard somebody pray before they even got the answer and they're already saying, thank you, Jesus? Here's the reason why they're doing that. It's because they know their authority in prayer. And the moment they pray it, they know that it's going to be done. And so right after the breath of prayer and petition is a breath of thanksgiving and gratitude. That's a request that will be made known to God, but that will also be received by God. Because God is into gratitude. The Bible tells us that we are to give God the fruit of our lips, a sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving unto God. You know, I was watching one of those medical drama shows. My wife likes to watch those, and so I was watching it with her. And they had a, a department head over, like, the whole department of heart surgery. And he, he was a great surgeon, a brilliant man. And so the, 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 whole, the leader of the whole place came up to him, and he says, Hey, I just want to let you know we, don't, we haven't seen your budget yet. I need your budget. And he says, well, why do I got to do a budget? You know, why do I got to do this? I, I don't want to do that. I'm a surgeon. I, I want to go do heart surgeries. And he says, but you're the head of the department. And so you're the one that's responsible to put in your budget. And he says, here's the deal. It's an Excel spreadsheet. You put everything you want on there. And as long as it's on there, you get it. But if you don't ever submit your budget, you don't get anything. And so grudgingly and wailingly, he, he assigned one of his, his administrative assistants to go sit with him and do his budget. Now, I haven't finished the episode, so I don't know how it finishes. But the principle for all of us is this, is God is saying to you and to me tonight, I want you to submit your Excel spreadsheet. I want you to get a hold of the things that you have need of from the word of God, and I want you to petition me, and I want you to get it into the halls of heaven. I want you to approach the throne room. I want you to get out your Excel spreadsheet spreadsheet and get in there everything that you want. My family, my future, my finances, my dreams, my destinies. I want the salvation of my neighborhood. I want the salvation of my family. God, I want to see the Inland Empire saved. God, I want to see the gospel go to the four corners of the world. God, we want to see it take place. God, I want to see the miracles. God, I want to see the signs. God, I want to see the wonders. And if you get that in, then guess what? You can have it. But if you don't get it in, you don't get it. Anything. That's the authority we have in prayer. Love how the New Living Translation says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything with thanksgiving. Can we give God a great big thanks and a great big praise tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.